Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rachel Varga, and I have a very special guest with us. If you're tuning in on the Rachel Varga podcast or you're watching the video on my YouTube channel, today I have Sherry Clark, and she is known across the world as a midlife courage coach. And why I'm bringing Sherry on the show with you is really because you know, for me, I'm in my mid thirties and I really look towards what my most vibrant patients are doing and they're women in their sixties. They've got things figured out. They've gone through the challenges I haven't gone through yet. And no matter, you know, what age you are listening to this, you're either going to be able to identify with, with Sherry, with some of the tips she's going to be sharing, or you'll be kind of like me, be like, okay, how can I be more, more gracious to say, my mother or other women who I'm interacting with that are going through these quote unquote forks in the road, as Sherry likes to say. So Sherry, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Rachel. Yes, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. I had the privilege of having Sherry interview me recently as well, and we had a lot of fun. And so we wanted to do it again and just spread a lot of this love light, uh, you know, information at this time, because going through transitions in our life, no matter what they are, life events, hormonal changes, they're all events. And there are some light and shadowy things with that. And we're going to give you some strategies to kind of work through some of the challenges that can be experienced. So what I'd like you to do before we dive into this two-part series here is just go ahead and take a screenshot of you listening, tag myself at Rachel Varga Official and at Unlock Your Vitality. And Sherry, where can people tag you as well on social media? Um, you can, I'm Sherry Clark and it's spelled unusually. It's S-H-E-R-E-E. -E, and then my last name is Clark, the normal way. Perfect. And I'm going to be sharing all of her information in the description and show notes below because she's got a really cool gift for you. So make sure that you check that out. The links are all going to be down below. So in this two-part series, we're going to be talking about some pretty cool topics here that I see a lot of women struggling with. So why not try and help you guys out a little bit and share some insight into how to kind of navigate those stuff. So what to do when things look good, but don't feel good, right? So you know, say you have the house, you've got the career, but you just kind of aren't really feeling fulfilled. So we're going to be talking about that in the first episode of this two-part series. And then we're going to dive into, well, how do we navigate that niggle of wanting more in our life and how to improve our lives as we age and really how to evolve through that. And yeah, I'm really excited to get started in this two-part series. So Sherry, take it away. What can we do when things are looking good on the outside, but you know, we might not be feeling as fulfilled as we would hope and sort of feel as good as we'd want to feel, you know, especially when we're, when we're 35 and then we start of our, we hit 48 and we're like, oh, things aren't quite enough anymore. You know, I think the first place to start with all of this, Rachel, is the whole idea of acknowledging that, that sometimes we have feelings about things that we thought we thought life was going to be a certain way, you know, like when you you got accepted to college and you go away and you get go to school and you get your first job and this happens and that happens and you have this this idea in your head of how your life is going to unfold and what it's going to feel like and what the house is going to look like and what the car is going to look like and what the guy is going to look like and sometimes it goes according to plan up to a certain point and you're like yeah you know what i really did a good job with this planning thing look at this the cards are all falling into place and other times something might happen that gets in the way and sometimes the thing that gets in the way is you sometimes it's just the way the world works and um, sometimes it's a world event like a pandemic that could get in the way of us you know having the things that we want and sometimes you change you get what you wanted you cross the finish line and then you realize okay well now that i'm here it's not quite the way that i imagined it going so i think the very first place to start is to simply say what is it that I'm feeling? And is it because of an unmet, unmet expectation of a disappointment? Where is my discomfort or disconnect coming from? 
Mm-hmm. And I think what you said about, well, things are changing. That's actually kind of inevitable, right? Things are never going to be static. Things are always changing. That's actually a physical law of our universe. Things are constantly in motion. But sometimes that change can be kind of scary for people. So what are some of those sort of initial niggles that people can be feeling when they feel like they're ready for change? Sure. Um, Great question. Because the, and, and the reason I'm glad that you asked the question is, the most important thing that anybody can listen to this conversation and walk away with is knowing that you're not alone, you're not broken, you're not weird, you're not going to be feeling this way the rest of your life, that many women, I can't say all, um, but I can speak for myself and I can say that I thought I was going after the things that I really wanted in life. And there was a point that I was, that I felt satisfied, but then little things will happen. And here are what some of those signs might look like. Sometimes it's something as basic and little as it's just harder to get up in the morning, you know, and you write it off to, well, I'm getting older. I need more sleep or um, I got to stop eating so late at night or I'm eating too many carbs or um, whatever. He snores. Um, and it could be one of those things, but it could also be that there's something inside of you that hasn't come to the front of your mind yet. It's still in the back of your mind because typically when we want to make changes, that's where the idea or the notion for change lives. It lives back here. And the way that change comes about is that change will start moving a little bit forward. And what happens is, excuse me, it taps you on the shoulder And it allows a little thought to go past the front of your mind where you might allow yourself a thought like, maybe I should look for another job. Maybe this marriage isn't all it was cracked up to be after this many years. Or maybe I really need to start exercising, lay off the sauce, make some change, whatever the change is. And it goes like that just kind of like out of the corner of your eye, then it'll get a little bit louder and you'll find yourself maybe mentioning it to a friend aloud, you know, and you say, you say it tentatively, almost like dipping your toe in the water of the lake to see how cold the lake is. And then as soon as you say it, it becomes a reality as well, right? Exactly. So, so it becomes a snowball. It becomes a thing. So, and I was speaking of some of the, some of the indications, the having a hard time getting up in the morning is one of them. Um, Snapping at people being, having a little bit of anxiety and grumpiness and that type of thing. And sometimes that's hormonal. Sometimes that is something else, but sometimes it's also your inner guide, your, you, saying, damn it, girl, I'm not happy. We need to address this. And what do I got to do to get your attention? And so I would be mindful about those kinds of things, Um, cravings for certain things. And I don't mean just food, craving for experience, craving for just time alone, time away. Again, it could be that you're working too much, but it could be that you need to take time and step back and listen to your your inner self and say, do we need to update? Is it time to relook at the 20 year plan? Cause it's been 23 years. Maybe we need need to update. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was brilliant. What you just said. I mean, think of how many times we update our computers and our smartphones. Well, newsflash, we've got to update and upgrade, upgrade our body, mind, spirit, energy, lifestyle practices all the time because for example, a skincare routine that you did when you were 35 probably isn't going to cut it when you're 45. And the same goes with your, with your, your life and your experiences. I really just, you know, I look at women like you, Sherry, and I just see so much wisdom in you and your life experiences and just your willingness to share this. And what you just said about women really tuning into those little niggles of, okay, maybe I need to change something in this aspect of my relationship to have it be fulfilling. And one thing that I've experienced with my partner is that he's seen me evolve and it's kind of scared him. 
And, you know, he realizes that I'm the type of person that I'm big into personal development and he's very much able to just be the rock that he is for me. And I'm very grateful for that. But what's very normal that we, we haven't touched on yet is, is that partners typically evolve at different rates. Yeah. Oh, they definitely do. Yeah. And, and, and not just partners, not just life partners, but also your friends. Totally. And um, your family members. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I have a client right now that's, that's making some changes and she goes, how do I deal with this with the family? They're going to expect the old me and the, the old way. And how do I deal with that? You know, and it's, it's really becomes a matter of how are they going to deal with it? Because you're dealing with it just fine. So yeah, realizing that you, when you change one thing, you change a lot of things, maybe not everything, but the dynamic of the, of your relationships can shift. I find most of the time for the better because mm -hmm when you come to a relationship, any kind of a relationship, it could be employer employee relationship. You are a better boss when you're happy and when you're at peace with yourself and you found where you need to be and you feel grounded and secure. You can, your life jacket's on, you can help everybody else put on theirs. But when you feel like you're drowning, it's really hard to be that role model boss or that great loving partner or best friend because you're not feeling it. Mm -hmm. And to not just kind of push through that and be like, oh, this is just a stage, push through it. Because what's going to happen is you're going to look back on that and be like, oh man, I really wish that I had really listened to that inner knowing and was really in tune with myself and my intuition and realized that, hey, time for some change. Things are never static. Exactly. You know, it's funny, the analogy that I use when I'm talking about this is that if your car starts making a weird noise, and they have a way of doing that, don't they? Making this gosh awful noise. One way of addressing it is to turn up the radio, because then you don't hear the noise anymore but you didn't fix the car. <laughs> so, you know, you can just disregard all those niggles if you want, but at the end of the day, it's still there. Oh my gosh. That is actually the best analogy I think I've ever heard <laughs> because our body will tell us things. Our body, mind, spirit, energy will tell us when we need to sort of pick things up a little bit, right? Because our, our bodies change. So if you're kind of feeling like, oh, I've just, you know, feel like I've just been a little bit hormonal, like been a little bit snappy. Well, get your hormones checked. There's some great labs with amazing health providers that you and I are connected with, right? So feel free to reach out to Sherry if you have any questions about how to navigate this because Sherry, you work with people one-on-one -on -one with us. I work on, I work one-on-one -on -one and I also do group um, because mm -hmm. I find that women work well in community and in tribe. And um, I do, I have a year long program that I do. It's a group of women. I call it road to a new you. And we, um, we work together for 12 months on whatever issues you bring. And sometimes women will come in with the idea in mind that they're going to work on this one area. And then they go, I, didn't know, I think I'm going to work on that over there because really that's where the issue lies, not here. And so um, it's, and it's wonderful to, to do it in community where you can be witness to um, other people's growth, be inspired by other people's growth um, and get ideas. So that's always a good thing. And, and I also do one-on-one -on -one as well. I don't want to diminish that, but sometimes I think women find um, a little bit more, a little bit more peace in community. Yeah, I did this really cool women's circle online in this virtual group, and I believe you were there as well. Were you there without? Yeah, I, I thought you were. And it was so cool. So we were in this big group of like 30 women, and then the facilitator put us in smaller groups of three. And one was sort of like the speaker, one was the listener, one was the observer, and then we all took turns switching. I thought that was so fantastic. So for, for example, when I was sharing with the two people in the small group, someone was listening to me and someone was also then observing and then giving me that feedback. So after I shared what I was feeling about certain things right now in particular, uh, for us how to be leaders during this time of this quote unquote black swan, right? 
and how to continue to share light in a time where things are a little bit shadowy and a little scary for a lot of people. And I learned things about myself from working and being in connection and community with other women. And it was so powerful that we might not be able to pick up if we're just trying to tune into ourselves because we see our reality. But then when you work with other women that can also kind of be a little bit more objective and in a safe space, I love that idea of community. And I think that a lot of women are craving that. Yes, absolutely. And it, it's, it is, it's so delightful to see, particularly when you come together from places where you haven't known each other your entire life. Because here's the thing, sometimes part of the issue, and I, I'm, I'm hesitant to even use the word problem because I don't view it as a problem, but sometimes part of the paradigm that we're operating under is that you start to feel a little bit of a dissatisfaction in something, some kind of a role perhaps that you're filling. And you wanna confide in your best friend, but she's been your best friend for 27 years. And she can't imagine you any other way because she's not involved own. in this particular role, in this particular setting. Maybe your best friend works with you and you're thinking about leaving your career and your best friend doesn't think it deliberately, but, but she's in her, in her subconscious mind is going, well, what's it going to be like if you leave here? Totally. It won't be the same for me. And so we, we have to be mindful that even those who love us, have an, have a, a, an agenda, um, have a, a horse in the race, if you will. So when you come together in community with people who don't have that for you, they see you as a, you're a clean slate. You're, you're whatever you tell them that you are. And you have new freedom and you have the ability to spread your wings and try new roles on it and to to push different envelopes and the sides of the box that you don't have that luxury with people who have seen you every day, day in and day out for the last however many years. Mm -hmm. And just that practice of actually being vulnerable with other women. And I know there's, there's men listening to this podcast as well. And, and some men are really wanting to get in tune with what their partner might be going through or a lot of men, they go through these, the same things that we do as well. So it's not just exclusive to, to women, but also for, for men. So Sherry, what do we do in our home and our surroundings no longer fulfill us? <laughs> um, well, the first thing, like I said, is explore and acknowledge that there is something that might be unsettled. The second would be to see if you can discern what that thing is, not solve it, identify it, because that's mm -hmm. the first thing. And just like when we go to a physician, I love analogies. So when we go to the physician, the physician, the first job is the diagnosis. The first job isn't the prescription or the remedy or the follow-up. It's figuring out, okay, this, you have this symptom and this symptom so that leaves that out or whatever. So trying to discern what that is, but also just like a good physician isn't going to be married to, you know, I really want this to be what the thing is that I diagnose because I know how to fix that. You really want to be in the position where you say, I think it's this, but I also have my eyes open that it could be this. Mm -hmm. Um, because it might be a completely different area and that one is a symptom and the other is the disease and that, and you might have that backwards. So just being mindful about that and then being able and willing to try out new things and to, to look at where, where we could go next to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious with your personal journey of, you know, navigating aging and things like that, how do you feel about aging? Because me personally, I know I'm, you know, still in my 30s, things like that, but I'm actually really excited to age. And it, this isn't something for us to be scared about because I see women like yourself. I see women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s who are living their best life and they're wiser. They're just, you know, these beams of light because they've really done that inner work and they've really been able to 
attachment to really cultivate this vibrancy and radiance in what I consider my most vibrant patients. You'll hear me talk about this all the time and what I reference to in my, uh, my book and masterclass. So what's been actually the coolest thing that you've learned after you've kind of crossed over into to midlife, if you will? I think one of the coolest things I've learned is that nobody is really paying as much attention to you as you think they are. That, you know, we, I had for so long um, a looking good uh, vibe or fixation. And I don't mean just necessarily looking good on the outside, but I mean like I wouldn't open my mouth to say anything unless I knew I was right or I wouldn't volunteer for something unless I was sure I could knock it out of the park. Like I needed so badly to be so perfect. Mm. And in reality, the best favor that we can do for ourselves and for the world is to just show up. Mm -hmm. Show up in your authenticity, show up in, with your warts, show up with the way you mispronounce things and the way you can't figure out the app on your phone. And it doesn't mean to be an imbecile, but it means to not be afraid to say, you know what, there's some things I'm really freaking awesome at. And there's a few things I can't figure my way out of a paper bag about. And realize that the people that are gonna love you are gonna love you. And the people that fall in love with the person who worked their butt off to look so perfect and to, that's not really you, that's exhausting. And that's not a good match. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, in the next part of this, this two-part series here, I really want to get into how we navigate that little niggle when we know we really need to change things up. And really, what does that look like? So I really want to ask you in this, the second part of the series here, how do we respond to that niggle? of wanting to improve our lives as we age and evolve and do it with, with grace, compassion with those around us. What does that look like? So I, I mentioned at the beginning that an important thing to do is to, uh, to acknowledge it and to, to say, you know, this is real and this is something that I'm willing to face. And then I hinted at that then you might want to mention it to a trusted other and be, be, um, judicious about that selection, be thoughtful about who you trust with. And I don't mean that you're, I don't mean to be guarded, but I mean, treat your, the feelings that you're having about yourself as little embryos, as precious little things that you want to make sure if I had a, a, a Robin's egg in my hand and went and, and passed it on to someone else to take care of, I would want to ensure that the person I was handing it to understood that a robin's egg is very fragile mm -hmm. and that if they're not mindful and they aren't holding it properly, they could cost its existence. Your next incarnation is that fragile. So don't be willy nilly about running out and being like, I don't know, I think I've got a problem. Be more, treat it more sacredly mm -hmm. because it is sacred. Mm -hmm. And then I think that moving back from that would be um, to make a decision that you're willing to, to do what it takes to at least explore with those other things. I'm sorry, I've got some sunlight going on here. Oh, it's beautiful. It's like right over like your throat. Okay. As you're talking. I was like, oh, you got some like light got, on your throat chakra. My throat chakra is illuminated. <laughs> totally. That's that's actually exactly what I thought when I first saw it. So. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. It's great. I love it. <laughs> so so I think it's um so then to not be afraid to take it to the next level. And that next level might be deciding you're going to do something about it. And for the women who come to my group, they have come and said to me, I've got something I want to work on and, and group or individual. Um, and I'm not saying it has to be me. I'm saying it could be look for whatever that next thing is. The next thing for you might be reading a book or taking an online class. It might be visiting with someone one-on-one -on -one. and you don't have to make that decision until you've gone a little bit further and investigated, just like you wouldn't buy the first car on the lot in the first parking stall. 
you're going to go and say, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I want. This is what I'm not sure about. I haven't thought about this, but I'm going to try that. And just really try on what some of those options might be. And then the most important part of it all, once you make a determination that you're going to move forward and explore and see if maybe this is a place that I want to go and this is where I want to, what I want to see is to do it with intention mm -hmm. and to walk into whatever uh, you're looking at doing next as being something that you take really seriously. And I don't mean to sound like terribly serious about all this. I have a pretty fun side to me, but I guess the, the thing that I keep, the word I keep wanting to say is sacred. Mm -hmm. You are sacred. Your journey is sacred. And don't settle. Don't say, oh, it's good enough. It doesn't hurt that bad. Well, that's like eating bad chocolate. That's a good <laughs> Don't waste calories on bad chocolate. Just say no to bad chocolate. You hold out for the good stuff. Yeah, I love that analogy. And I think what happens with people, and I, I know I'm just going to share this, that, you know, there's been times when I've gotten a little bored. So what do I do? Started a YouTube channel, started a podcast, started in interviewing these awesome people, started writing a book, did an online course. And the reason I did that was because I've been so used to studying and working. So it's like for me to be working and not having something on the evenings or weekends to really like fulfill me, light me up, connect with amazing souls like yourself, Sherry, and learn ways that I can help others in really cool, cool ways has really lit me up. And obviously I don't have a family yet, but what I see with a lot of these beautiful patients that I work with in the clinic that come to see me, and also for people wanting virtual skin consults with me as well, is they get to this point when they're in their 60s and they're just kind of a little bit bored with their partner and they're not feeling beautiful. And I think of just this one beautiful woman that came to see me recently. I had her permission to share the story. Obviously, I'm not going to be identifying her, but when you're listening, you're, you're going to know this is you. She's literally my muse for why I wrote my book, Unlocking Your Vitality why I created my 30 video web series and my masterclass called Unlocking Your Vitality. She's why I did it because I see people like her that are just killing it, right? She's got her lifestyle dialed down, her yoga, Pilates. She's getting in nature all the time. She's got a solid meditation and spiritual practice. She's got a family. And so it looks really good. And then I told her, I'm like, you are so beautiful. You have no idea. And, you know, I've worked with thousands of people over the last 10 years in the, in the clinic and also online. She's like, really? Like, I don't feel like that. I'm like, you are stunning. And I think sometimes when we hear these types of compliments, we can automatically default to, oh, that's an insincere, that's an insincere compliment. And how sad is that for not to accept what's what a gift that someone is trying to share with us? And I, I, I noticed in this one individual, it's like she really just kind of like needed that, that support. So having that community support with other people that you can trust and really talk to is just, it's such a beautiful thing because when people on the outside look, you know, everything looks great like we're talking about in this series here, but deep down it maybe isn't feeling quite so good if you're seeing someone kind of waver a little bit or you're seeing their, that they're sort of struggling, maybe ask them, well, how can I help you? If they're seeming a little bit short or a little anxious or, you know, they're really reactive and just aren't really behaving the way that you're used to them behaving, ask them, how can I help you? Don't say like, oh, you look tired. You look a little stressed out. What's going on? It's how can I help you? Just sort of kind of switch that. But I really want you to talk about, Sherry, you know, what do certain habits that we can start to take on, such as, you know, drinking a little bit more or eating a little bit more, when we start to put those types of habits into our lifestyle that maybe weren't there before and we start to do them a little bit more, what is that maybe telling us that we should pay attention to? You know, those are, those are some of the warning signs. And here's something that, um, because I know you and I know that 
I know you'll um, accept this. When you were talking about um, you writing a book and doing other things that lit you up because you felt like you wanted to engage, because you're at the age that you're at, that's exactly what you're doing and it's fabulous. I did some of those same things when I got a little bit older and I did them to escape. Oh. Um, I, I wrote three books in my old incarnation because I didn't want to do what I was doing. And it was something that let me get away. Um, it was so much work and so much distraction that it was, it, it became, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. In my I know your little kitty wants to chime in too. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> he's yelling. I don't know why he's doing that. <laughs> I think it's because it's something I need to pay attention to as well. When you said that, well, what I would do is I would actually, you know, go for a girl's trip on Salt Spring and I would park myself in the middle of the woods with my notepad. So yes, what you said, it was my escape to get away from the city noise to get away from the quote unquote materialistic, how we're supposed to be living and, and being in this world. It absolutely was an escape for me, but it was a beautiful escape for me and it allowed me to uncover things for me, but that, that is exactly what it was. It was an escape. Perfect. Okay. So then, so then that's beautiful. I'm glad I, I followed my instinct and asked you that or mentioned it because for me, it wasn't an escape to something better. It was escape away from something I needed to get out of. And for me, it, it was that I wasn't happy in my career any longer. And I owned a business and I was very successful and making a lot of money, which makes it harder. You know, you would think, well, it's, yeah, great. You're making a lot of money. No, it makes it harder to change because that part of it is so good that you, you think to yourself, well, I've got to surrender that to get to the next thing. And, and it's such a part of your identity. Yes. And it's, it becomes golden handcuffs. So for me, the writing of the books was so that I didn't have to feel the pain of the, the career that I didn't love anymore. So, um, so being mindful of that. So this is really an important part of this discussion. It's being mindful that what you're doing, the motivation of the, of what you're doing is as important as what it is that you're actually, what your movements are. So be mindful that you might be doing something that seems on the outside like, yeah, this is a good project. I'm volunteering for this organization or I've taken on this role. And yes, it's good. Why are you doing it? Good question to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I'm going to add to that, that I feel like I was also really lacking community with fellow healers. Mm -hmm. right with with fellow light workers if you you've heard me talk about this if you want a reference to it read rebecca campbell's book she really dives into it uh, her book light is a new black and rise to rise it really actually triggered me to listen to that niggle inside me on how to you know not just be a nurse and show up to a job it's like there's so much more that i want to be experiencing and doing but that's definitely one thing that i noticed especially when i got to meet you know other wonderful healers like yourself through Mindshare is there's so many people out there that have a similar life purpose and mission to me. And through all of that, it actually led me to meet people like you. Right. And, and I, that moving in that direction, you kind of know it when you're doing it and yeah. you, yeah, it's just being honest with yourself. Yeah. But that's interesting. It's like, why are you, I feel like I'm getting some laser coaching here, but, <laughs> but realizing, okay, you might be a little bit bored, pick up a project. Well, why are you doing that project? What's the intention, right? Are you trying to escape? You're trying to do something to build upon your, your, your physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health, your energetic health. So sometimes when you think of an activity that you could be doing, it could also be that niggle to support your health holistically as well. Yes. Yeah. So are you doing it because it's a vitamin or because it's a salve on a wound? You know, is it going to give you the next level or is it to insulate you from what's what you don't want? Yeah. Yeah. I'd feel like when I would write and get lit up, it was not only sparking my creativity, it was getting me away from city noise. So it was pulling me out of the the sympathetic nervous system state and more into the parasympathetic 
and also grounding me. So listening to that, taking my journal outside, getting into nature, having that sacred time with your girlfriends, because my husband wasn't really getting any of that. And that's not an uncommon thing. I just saw you nod there. And it's like, how many women listening to this that are on this path of self-discovery notice that their partner isn't there with them and they just don't get it. And that's not a, that's not a bad thing. He actually helps me stay grounded, believe it or not. <laughs> but what's your take yeah. on that? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, there's a, I think that you can have all kinds of perspectives in their mission critical. Um, my group meets on um, once a week and the one that I lead and we met today and someone made a remark and someone else said, oh, I didn't interpret it that way. And, and you could see the shift. You can see it when someone says, oh, I, that's not how I looked at it because it's not laden with uh, emotion. It's, mm. it's merely someone with a different perspective. And because they don't have a horse in the race, like we were talking about um, earlier, um, then you can accept that and go, oh, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting way of looking at something. Yeah. And exactly how you said that. It's like, oh, you want to find something, but you know, is it an escape for something else? And yeah. it totally was. And I, it's funny, I never thought about it that way. But I, I feel like that was just like my way of giving my body, mind, spirit, energy, what it needed. Yeah. Just yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great? I know. The yeah. things that we can learn from one another, if we're just willing to, to be open to it. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about one o'clock. I know a lot of us are, you know, in quarantine right now, or we're kind of looking at this black swan, right, event that we're going through. And, you know, there's been people loading up on toilet paper, there's been people loading up on pantry goods, on their alcohol. So tell me a little bit about the concept of wine o'clock, and what that could actually be telling us. <laughs> so the thing about it is, is that many times the wine o'clock kind of occasion, and it could be any kinds of things. So for some people, the numbing out substance is food. Um, and oftentimes, for, especially with women, it's sugar. So what we'll do is it will start out innocuously. Oh, it's just a little taste. It's a treat. Mm -hmm. It's a this, it's a that. And, then it, and it can snowball. And what happens with anything that is a that creates a numbing out situation is that you're doing it to avoid the feeling of confrontation. Mm. And it's not necessarily always about avoiding pain. It could be avoiding deciding. It could be avoiding acknowledging. It could be avoiding whatever, it, making, making a decision. Oh, I don't want to even think about that. So I'll do this instead. Mm -hmm. And the danger in that is that you begin to then move away from what could have been the next chapter. Because very often, it's when we're talking about change and feeling unsettled. If you know that there's a change that's begging to be made in your life and you're avoiding it, and one way of avoiding it is numbing it out, then at some point or another, that opportunity to make that change will probably go away you'll age out and it's too late to maybe change your career or something, whatever. And I don't know about you or our listeners, but I would rather be the person in charge. I would rather make my own not so great decision and know that I was in charge than to just take myself out of the game and let fate decide. So mm -hmm. I, I think that just being mindful about that and just being honest with ourselves. We kind of know when it's happening um, and we have a way of dismissing it. Yeah. You know, I really need to do something about that. Maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I won't have wine after work or I won't eat chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's just important to not kid ourselves. Yeah. I think that's really important. The whole concept of wine o'clock I'm seeing so many of, you know, my friends and people I follow on social media, like the, they're homeschooling their kids at home, they got their wine glass with them. And, you know, it's, it's tough for people right now. So people are coping in different ways. But looking back for myself, I'm just going to be real and vulnerable with you guys. When I did drink more wine, say when I was cooking meals and things like that, there were things that I needed to work through. 
Absolutely. And your cat meowed again. Your cat seems to meow at some pretty key points. It's well, it's um, dinner time in our <laughs> yeah. world. And my cat has a, has a certain schedule that he adheres so to. We could all learn from that. And speaking of, of schedule, um, you know, I did a previous talk with uh, Stacey Lindsay, and she's the pre previous contributing editor of Goop Magazine. She's a multimedia journalist, she's been on CBS, Fox News, just a massive, you know, powerhouse in the world of, of journalism and media. And she shared something that I'd like to share with, with you guys listening and watching is that, you know, instead of having your wine o'clock, why don't you schedule in actually in your eye calendar on your smartphone, this is something I'm gonna be doing now too, actually your time for self-care. So whether that's working out, your yoga, your meditation, do that. And when you feel like, oh, I'm gonna you know, pour myself a glass at the end of the day, I'm gonna unwind. No, try and do something that's gonna promote your self-care instead. I love that. And I think that it's so true that if you don't schedule it, it's not going to happen. And really, for me, I know, for, I know in my world, my self-care has to happen first thing in the morning before it can get taken away. Yeah. And these Which are just yours, Rachel. Well, this is just such a nugget of, of insight from someone like you. You know, you've really gone through all, so many of the stages of evolving as a woman. So, you know, for someone like me to look up to you, it's just a really beautiful thing. You have so much insight to share. Uh, so for me to ground, I actually, you know, right before my calls today, I just went outside and fed my little ducks. There's two little beautiful ducks that have, you know, made their homes in my little pond here at my house. And so I just, I, I really like starting the day with grounding, getting outside, putting my feet on the earth. Some other things that I start my day off with when I get ready, I actually look into the sky and let the sun hit my eyes and my face before putting my moisturizer and sunscreen on so that you're getting that the dose of vitamin D, which is so important for our immune system. And, you know, really just getting outside in nature. That's one thing that I learned through my whole process of, of doing these, you know, creative outlets was my body really wanted me to escape the city and escape the sounds and escape the people and be out in nature to really kind of help myself be healthy. But definitely moving is really key just to get that like chi and energy flowing because I feel like with our minds, if we don't allow that to happen, what happens is our mind just turns into this like real, right? Yeah. And it might not actually be something that's positive. So when you work out, it's almost like you give yourself a bit of like a hormonal uh, reset. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I'm a big fan of body movement as well. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, the things that we did when we were younger. When I was younger, I was um, a runner and I, I actually, I ran six miles every morning before work. And wow. if, Yes. And every day. And if I had a flight and I flew a hundred thousand miles a year, um, so I flew a lot. If I had a 6 a.m. flight, I would get up and run at 3 a.m. Um, because I was so rabid about it. And that's fine. And it worked for me until it didn't. And, and it didn't as when I got older, and maybe some of you older listeners will appreciate that. It got to a point where that became an act of violence against myself. Yes. That instead of being energizing, I felt pistol whipped by the time yeah. I got to the airport. Um, it ceased to be a source of energy and enjoyment and became something depleting. And that's another way for us to know when we need to make a change. And it's hard. It's hard, you guys, because I viewed myself as a runner, not just a runner, but at every morning 3 a.m., six miles, girl. No, come hell or high water. And I live in a four-season state, so it could be thunder and lightning and snowing and high winds and ice. It didn't matter. I went out. And when, you, when that doesn't serve you any longer and you decide to back away from it for your own good, there's a hard reconciliation there. And I am now a yogi. And what's weird is during my running days, I would scoff at the yoga people and be That's like- That's not exercise, exactly. right? That's probably what you're saying, yeah. 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 And it was like, I, it was, 
like I could, I, it, I would rather, it would be a shame for me to even consider yoga. And now the idea of running now, I just, the violence of it, I just can't do it. And, and so we evolve in our lives around many things. That's just one example. So why, if I think, if, if I know that my exercise has to change because my body changed and the things that are important to me change, why couldn't my interest in my career, why shouldn't my relationship evolve? And I don't mean that you have to leave it. I mean that maybe the roles need to be redefined. Maybe we need to renegotiate how this relationship, the premise of the relationship, maybe some other things need to happen, whatever it is. So to not be fearful of those changes, but to embrace them and to say, this is part of my evolution. I couldn't have done this or known this at that age. I had to be this age. I couldn't do yoga when I was 30. It wasn't, it didn't fit me. It wasn't enough for you at that time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. What you talked about, uh, you know, the, the physical activity, you know, that does change as we go through, through our age or through our, through our life, because you know, we can no longer do that high impact stuff anymore because it's really hard on our hips and our knees. And so that's why I mentioned what my, you know, 60 plus year old, just beautiful patients are doing is that's, that's usually it, you know, getting some weight bearing exercise is really key. So for you guys listening, always find ways that are going to balance your stability and your flexibility, your cardiovascular training and your strength and conditioning. You need to hit on those three parts to really support your, your, your physicality. But do note that those just may evolve as you age. Yes, and, they, and it's interesting too, because when I made the, the transition from, the, from running, which made me sleep really good and I could eat whatever I wanted and I loved all that. And then when I made the transition, when my body was ready for it, my sleep became even more peaceful and more mm-hmm. refreshing and um and eating things at that point the the what i cared about eating changed at the same time so i didn't care about nachos and you know beer and those kinds of things anymore like i did when i was a runner i wanted to eat differently and more yogic <laughs> so yeah mm-hmm. That's also really wise what you just said there. It's if you're not exercising in the same way, or for example, you've got an injury and you're not able to work out for a certain period of time for whatever reason, you should modify your diet in order to meet your caloric needs. Because I find what happens with people is they get an injury. They get a buggered knee or, or a hip, and then they don't modify their diet and they put on a lot of weight which then makes things even harder on your joints. So just pay attention to that, that as you age, you're going to need to evolve and modify things in your life, but, but just be, be in tune with yourself and declutter the noise, right? And just really kind of figure out what your body needs. So the final question I want to ask you, Sherry, is why is decluttering our lives so key as we age and evolve? Oh, great question. So um, there's, you know, when, when we say declutter, most of the time people think of Marie Kondo and, you know, um, I, the, the, the thing that makes me laugh about her is that having you roll your underwear into like little sushi rolls. I declutter like a mad woman, but my underwear drawer does not look like that. <laughs> so, so there are some energetic reasons for that part of it, for, for decluttering your surroundings. When I say decluttering your life, and that's something that I ask the women that I work with to do, I'm talking about things like opening up your calendar, looking at what's on your schedule, one item at a time, stop, look at what's on your calendar, pause, and do a body check. Mm. How do I feel when I look at that? If I'm chairing an event and I have a weekly meeting with the committee and I look at that, do, does my, the corner of my mouth turn up because I'm excited and happy and I love that group and what it's doing for the community, then that's a sign. Do I grimace and think, oh my gosh, I hope we have a snowstorm that night so the meeting can be canceled legitimately. That's another sign. So look through, and, and I'm not just talking about work obligations and meetings. I'm talking about if you are um, someone who serves others and you have clients or customers, 
how do you feel about your customers and your clients? If you're having uh, in, uh, regular you know, soirees with your friends, how do you feel about those? And look at every one of those, that every one of those events has a clue for you and your body will give you a signal. So that's one area of decluttering. Another area of decluttering is decluttering your schedule of the things that might not be written on there, but the things that you do automatically. If you come home from work and while you're um, creating maybe a not so nutritious meal and you're listening to the news and bad, <laughs> the bad stuff that's going on in the world or just you know mindlessly letting something in, maybe evaluate that. What's it doing for you? Is it taking energy away or is it giving it to you? And that's what I mean by decluttering your life and really looking at that. Where is your energy coming from and where is it being expended? Ooh, I love that. And the, what you said about making a non-nutritious meal. So that would be like something that's just heavily packaged foods, not a lot of active enzymes, not a lot of colors with, with your greens and things like that maybe some industrial meat, like industrial poultry, which is just full of, you know, hormones and all sorts of things. And then yes, the news really kind of, if you feed into, especially with what we're dealing with now, that sort of like field and you get sucked into that, yes, of course, that's going to end up washing over you. So really do what you can to actually really protect yourself from things that you know aren't going to be serving you and decluttering. And I just, I love I love finishing up this, uh, this series with you talking about just that. That was a great take home. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining, joining us here, Sherry. Where can people find you? How can people work with you? I know we're going to have your, your links in the show notes and description box below, but yeah. just you know, share with us right now where we can, where we can find you and work with you. Well, if, they, if your listeners look in the show notes, um, I'm giving you a gift. I have a, a special little thing that I'm providing for you. It's, um, it's, a, it's a conversation starter because one of the things I mentioned when we were talking today was having a conversation with yourself and asking yourself, is this serving me? Does this work? Is this providing me energy? Am I still happy doing this? And it'll be a good um, way for you to begin exercise, that exercise process to flex that muscle for conversations. If you would like to visit my regular website, it's www.fork-road.com. I will also tell you that I answer my own emails. So if you um, send an email to me, I will respond to it personally. Oh, I love that. You got to have that personal touch when you're doing the stuff online. I totally agree. Well, thanks so much for listening, everybody. Be sure to share you listening. Tag me at Rachel Varga Official. And take a screenshot if you're listening to this episode, share it with your friend or family member. And when you share it, I'll get notified and I'm going to send you a free gift as well. So if you haven't already, you can download my uh, treatment planning guide. And I also have this great skin cheat sheet, which is basically like my five best skin tips. And you can always book a one-on-one -on -one virtual skin and rejuvenation consultation with me. I have my ebook, Unlocking Your Vitality, and my masterclass. They're all just great resources. The, the masterclass really is a deep dive into what I've been alluding to with this whole time with, with Sherry, talking about what my most vibrant patients are doing. And I recorded it on Salt Spring Island, which is a place where I would go to escape and get lit up and get creative. And you're actually going to see that in just in the way that my eyes look. It's really cool. When I look back on it, I was like, whoa, like I looked seriously lit up there myself so it's just a great offering and you know thanks again sherry for joining us today thanks for having me until next time we will see you in the next episode here on the rachel varga podcast or if you're watching the video on my youtube channel i'll see you guys in the next episode bye